finally, Abraham and Sarah have their promised child, Isaac. Their first star in the night sky that God has promised to fill. But as you hear the story, there is more to it than just promise and goodness and love of a family. You see, with the birth of Isaac, there would also then be the removal of another family member. See, Abraham already had a son. His name was Ishmael. He already had a relationship with a woman, with this son. They would then be asked very cruelly and meanly to leave. They would be forced out into the desert where, for all intents and purposes, would be left to dehydrate and starve. Had God not, God not miraculously intervened in their lives, they would have died. And this from the family that God called to himself. See, a pattern would be set in motion then of family lines being drawn, even within those that should be loved and should be cared for and yet being pushed out. We would see then, as the story progresses, that Isaac, as he is now the child of promise, grows up and fulfills all those promises. He is wonderful. And he meets the woman of his dreams, although it was a prearranged marriage, it was love at first sight with Rebecca. And in this union is born twin boys, Esau and Jacob. But even within the womb, these boys are fighting with each other. There's a war going on. And just like Abraham before, the pattern is now repeated in their lives as these parents, Isaac and Rebecca, choose a favorite child. Rebecca chooses Jacob because he loves to be around the tent and, and at home. And of course, Father Isaac, he loves the hunter of the family who brings home this wonderful game to cook up and eat. And now, we know as parents we're not supposed to have favorites. You know, that it, it, it doesn't work well. You don't do that. But they did. And from this choosing and favoritism would come a deception between a team of mother and son against father and the other son and brother to this Jacob. Of course, this would then lead to a, a big family crisis and a division in which there would have to be a separation or there would be a death of the brother. And so Jacob goes far away to a distant land to live with a relative named Laban. And there he works for, for seven years so that he could win the right to marry his true love, Rachel. And after those seven years, he's, he's ready. And it's, it's wedding time and it's wedding night. And that scoundrel Laban switches the brides. Now it's not like today. You have the wedding night, you got yourself a bride. There's no going back. Except it was Leah, not Rachel. So, as they barter then what they're going to do about this, and they come up with an agreement, okay, seven more years and you can have Rachel, sure. But look at the wound and the deep scar in the heart of Leah who could not find a husband unless she were tricked, unless the husband were tricked. She will now live the rest of her married life to a man who, who does not love her, whose heart belongs to her sister, who desperately tries to win his affections by having children, and she had a lot of boys. You'd think that would have really won her, the admiration of the father, but no. No, his heart was set on Rachel. It would be her child that would be the favorite, Joseph. Generation after generation, page after page, God is fulfilling His promises to bring a people close to Himself, to be their God and to bless the world through them. And yet there is this other story that's playing out in this very same family of choosing sides, of choosing who will be loved and who will be forced out. 
And just like his father before him, Isaac, and just like his grandfather before him, Abraham, so now Jacob chooses his favorite. And making a mighty spectacle of it at the time as he presents this ornate robe to his favorite son, Joseph. So that all the family can see that this child born from the union of the woman that he truly loves, this is the one. Of course his brothers hated him. Of course they despised him. They couldn't say a a fine word to him. It was all just... But who, who had drawn these boundary lines? Who had paraded Joseph before them and said, this is the one I love? You see, it was the, the father. It was Jacob it was the one who had chosen a special child. And, and so these brothers had no heartache whatsoever of taking that ornate robe that their father had made just for Joseph and, and ripping it to shreds and smearing it with animal blood and presenting it to their father, knowing the whole time that this will break his heart if not actually kill him with grief. They had no hesitation. That's how they had been treated, and now they will lie and deceive their father. Here the story would continue on and on, except God in his great Love and his wisdom will now do something new in the lives of his chosen people. And he will do it through the life of Joseph. Though his brothers have sold him into slavery in Egypt, and there his life will take many ups and downs, God is watching over Joseph. And there Joseph learns over time and through great difficulties that God is worth his trust and his faith. That God is a great reservoir of strength. That God is the great lover of the heart when everyone else has rejected you. Imagine the terror of Joseph looking out of the hole in which they have placed him as his brothers scowl and are ready to kill him and instead they yank him out of the hole and they they sell him off to Egypt. Imagine the pleading that he is doing with them. Please don't do this. And there is no mercy. Though he can find no mercy in his own family that should have loved him, he found a great mercy that would not end with God. For God watched over him and raised him up so that he would be second in command in Potiphar's house. Potiphar trusted him with everything except, of course, his wife. And, of course, his wife has plans on Joseph. False accusations, more deception. It all lands Joseph in jail where God proves himself to be of infinite grace and mercy and provision that he can be trusted even in the very depths and the bowels of the dungeon that he had been placed. For even there, God blesses him and and so that he becomes uh, in charge of the entire jail. God blesses him with wisdom that only he God possesses so that he could interpret the dream and now Joseph is in second in command of the entire land of Egypt and in perfect position to exact revenge. To circle out those whom he will love and those who will be unloved. First order of business should have been to go to Potiphar's house and dealt with her. Second order of business as he stands before His brothers was to exact his revenge on them. But instead, Joseph has been taught by God his heart is very different than his family. See, his heart can now say these words and mean them. He says, you intended to harm me, but God used all of this for the saving of many lives. I'm not going to exact my revenge on you, I'm not in the place of God. I'm in the place of his servant. I'm in the place of one who's been so loved and so taken care of. And now I'm going to be the one to take care of you, my brothers, though you have not deserved it. See, one of the truths that Joseph learned is that each and every one of us 
needs more love than we deserve. Think about that. We each need more love than we deserve. And in the intimacy of our family life, in the closeness of congregational life, in the closeness of community and classroom, there we have such opportunities to hurt one another, to circle out one another. You're important. You are special. You're dear to my heart. But even within our own families, there are those with whom we can say, not as special. This happens even in the very family of God. This happens at ascension. This happens in the girdle household. Because within each and every one of us, there is this great need for love and we will take what we can. We will circle up those whom we, lie, <coughs> whom we love. <coughs> but God is here to do something new. It will be a distinguishing mark among his people. He will do something new even in our lives. So that now as we hear these words of Jesus, where he says, But love your enemies and do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful." As we hear these words, you could see them as a threat. One more good thing I'm supposed to be doing, but I am not. But if you hear them in this heart, your heart will never change. Your heart will find some way to fulfill these words and yet still not really love those around you. There's only one change that comes, and it's from Jesus. It's from the Father. It's from the Holy Spirit, our triune God who comes and just loves us and began without ever knowing that it was God who did this because the sun came up this morning and it shone on the good and the bad. And the air that we breathe is available to all the people regardless of what kind of person you are. It is an object lesson that God's love God's acceptance, God's welcome is for absolutely everybody. None of us have received all of the love that we wanted. And every one of us are also the perpetrators of unloving actions and words. We have a great need and we do not deserve what God has given to us and yet He gives it. It's just really mind-boggling to understand that in these words of Jesus, to love your enemies is the acknowledgement that God has loved his enemies, that there's nobody outside of his welcome. The people that we have excluded from the church and said, well, until you change, you're not welcome." The people we have excluded from acceptability, the murderer, the rapist, the child molester, these all have been welcomed into God's family. The hate that you and I have in our heart does not exclude us. It's when you finally are brought to the utter depths of your soul and you see the darkness and the light that is shining even on you and me. That's when God, through the Holy Spirit, begins to change our hearts. And we find that really nothing can be taken from us. You see, if someone were to take our coat, that we really could give them our shirt. If someone were to disrespect you and call you all kinds of names, say all kinds of lies against you, that really your reputation is held safe and sound in God's keeping. And that there's no reason then to circle out those you love and those you don't because 
there is enough love with God. It's overflowing and abundant. But you don't just learn that by hearing about it. You learn it through the experiences of life, about being in the pit, about being in the dungeon, about being in the darkness of your own sin, and there God still coming. You learn it over the lifetime of consistency of God still saying to you, I love you. I want you. You are mine. With those eyes, we can see the cross of Jesus and know that he died for the sins of the entire world. And there's this great resource to draw upon. As we heard in our second reading, how God lifts us up and seats us with Christ. It is pure grace and gift that he does so. Not anything that we have done or now that we've been placed next to Christ, you better do. But a heart now led by God to be like his own. That's the reason that we're called uh, uh, children of the Most High. We're like him as he lives through us with this kind of love. As you hear these words cannot help but lead to a prayer. Lord, fill my heart with the faith that believes your word, that I am loved. Lord, give me the faith to believe that you will give me the strength to love those who are very difficult to love. Lord, give me the strength and the power from you to be your child in this world that is so unloving. And in this prayer, God answers. In this prayer, God is present. May the Lord bless you in this prayer. Amen. Children of the Most High, we